Hello, everyone. Welcome to our special Mobile World Congress 2017 coverage. I'm John Furrier here in the queue for two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, Monday and Tuesday, February 27th, 28th. And we have on the phone right now Lynn Comp, who's the Senior Director of the Network Platforms Group within Intel, part of the team doing the whole network transformation, the big announcements that went out prior to Mobile World Congress and hitting the ground on Monday and Tuesday on all next week in Barcelona. Lynn, great to have you on the phone. Thanks for taking the time to walk through some of the big announcements. Oh, thanks, John, for having us. It's a really exciting Mobile World Congress. We're seeing more and more of the promise of the next generation networks starting to take solution form from ingredient form a couple of years ago. So it's a great, great time to be in this business. So 5G is happening now. You're seeing it in the network and the cloud and at the client. That You guys use the word client, but essentially it's the people with their smartphones and devices, wearables, AIs, and now the client is now cars and flying drones and potentially whatever else is connected to the internet as an internet of things. This has been a really big moment, and I think I want to take some time to kind of unpack with you um, some of the complexities and kind of what's going on under the hood because uh, 4G to 5G is a huge step up in, in the announcement and capabilities, and it's just not another device. There's really unique intellectual property involved. There's um, uh, more power. There's more, uh, a market leadership in the ecosystem, and really is um, a new way for, for, for service providers to achieve profitability and for, get those products that are, that are trying to connect, that need more power, more bandwidth, more capabilities. Can you take a minute to just talk about the key announcements uh, impacting uh, Mobile World Congress from Intel's perspective this week uh, in your area? Yeah, so we had a whole group of announcements that came out, everything from solutions labs where operators are uh, invited in to work with Nokia and Intel starting out to start working through what does it mean to try and manage a network that includes unlicensed and licensed spectrum and all these different usage models, very different model for them, to uh, Ericsson, an initiative with GE and Honeywell and Intel that is an innovator's initiative where companies are invited to come in in the ecosystem and really start working through what does it mean to have this kind of network capability. If you think about what happens 2G, 3G to 4G, you start looking at the iPhone. It's been around for 10 years, and you've seen how the uses have changed and how application developers have come up with completely new ways of doing things, like who would have thought about crowdsourcing traffic patterns for driving directions? We all wanted it years ago, uh, but it was just recently that we were able to have that on a smartphone. They're trying to unleash that with uh, pretty unique companies. I mean, GE and Honeywell, UC Berkeley, you wouldn't necessarily think of them as being first on innovating new usage models for a wireless network. But with something like 5G, with all these diverse use cases, you end up with a completely different ecosystem really wanting to come in early and take advantage of the potential that's there. Lynn, talk about this end-to-end -end story, because one of the things that got hidden in all the um, news, and certainly Silicon Angle covered as well as, uh, it was a great article on, in Fortune about it, really kind of talking about more of the 5G versus Qualcomm, that was kind of the big story, the, you know, the, the, the battle of the chips, if you will, and the big, the big uh, 5G angle there. But there's more to it, and, and one thing that caught my attention was this end-to-end um, architecture and it wasn't just Intel. You guys are a big, you know, part of that as an ingredient, but it's not just Intel. And what does that mean end to end? And because I can see the wireless piece as an overlay and connecting devices, but where's the end to end fit in? Can you can you give some color on that? Absolutely. You know what's really fascinating is you've got Intel and, and we've been in the cloud and part of the genesis of what has become the consumer and the enterprise cloud from the very start. And so what we've been doing in working in that end-to-end -end arena is taking things like virtualization, which has allowed these service providers and enterprises to slice up compute resources. And instead of having something that's completely locked and dedicated on one workload, they can create slices of different applications that all sit on the same hardware and share it. And so if you look years ago, many of the service providers, cloud and enterprise, they were looking at utilization rates of maybe 15% of the compute power of a server. And now a lot of them are aiming for 75, 85% utilization. And 
And that's just a crazy amount of efficiency. So bringing that to this market that has traditionally had single-purpose boxes is very efficient for one thing, but that creates a business challenge if you need to do more than one thing. So really what we're showing, uh, for example, at, at Mobile World Congress, it's something that we call Flex RAN, and it's an example of how to run a radio area network on a standard server on Beyond Technology, and it does implement that network slicing that's very similar to the virtualization and the compute slicing, but taking advantage of it to use different bandwidth and different rates for different scenarios, whether IoT or smartphones or even connected cars. So I got to ask you about the, the big question I get is first of all thanks for that but the big question I get is this this isn't turning into an app show World Mobile World Congress uh, and the apps are everything from cars to just phone apps to uh, network apps etc and the question that everyone's asking is we need we need more bandwidth and, and and certainly 5G addresses that but the service providers are saying do we really need all that power when does it come is what's the timing of all this so specific question to you is Lynn is what is Intel doing to accelerate the network transformation for the service providers to get 5G ready? Because that seems to be the main theme is the um, orientation of where the progress bar is relative to is it ready for prime time? Is it here and now? Is it out in, is out in the future? Is this kind of a pre-announcement? So there's kind of a, some confusion. Clarify that up. Where's the progress bar and how is Intel accelerating network transformation? for folks in the service provider business to be 5G ready? So there's a couple things. So let me start with the accelerating piece because it also relates to the end-to-end -end piece. Um, when you look at the way that networks have been constructed all the way end-to-end, -end, it has traditionally been a very, very limited set of solution providers, and they tend to provide pretty granular, pretty high granular, granular functions. So the appliance, the full appliance, software, hardware, everything. Um, and I would look at some of the smartphones up until you could put new applications on it as appliances. It did voice. And so we've had the service providers begging us for many years, give us an ecosystem that looks like server and PC. I want a building block ecosystem. I want to be able to take advantage of best of breed suppliers in software and hardware. I need people to come innovate like they go innovate on Amazon and so build me an ecosystem. So Intel Network Builders is something that was started about three years ago and we had oh, half dozen to maybe 12 different vendors who are part of it, mostly software vendors. Since then, we have 250 plus members, and they range from service providers like KT and Telefonica, all the way to the hardware vendors like Cisco and Ericsson, and then the software vendors that you would expect. So that's one thing that we've been really working for a few years now on getting these operators building block approaches, supporting them in open source. We had a big announcement from at and talking about uh, how they were putting about 7 million lines of code into the Linux Foundation, and it's code that's been deployed in their network already. So pretty big departure from normal practice. And then today, we had an announcement that came out where not only is at and and Bell Canada and Orange in that community, now we've got China Mobile, China Telecom, and a project called OpenO also joining forces if you were to map out the CapEx for these operators, you've got almost all of the top 10 that are joining this project to completely change the way that they run their networks. And that translates into the kind of innovation, the kind of applications that consumers love, that they're already getting out of the cloud. Now they can begin to get that pace of innovation and creativity in the network as well. So the building block approach seems to be your strategy for the ecosystem. What's the challenge to keep that rolling and cohesive? How, would, how are you guys going to foster that uh, growth on the ecosystem? Are you guys going to be doing a lot of joint yeah. marketing and funding yeah. projects? And uh, <laughs> how, are you, how are you going to foster that, that uh, uh, continuing growth? Well, there's a couple. It's such an opportunity rich environment right now. Even things that you would assume would be normal and kind of standard practice, like standardized benchmarking, because you want apples to apples performance comparisons. Well, that's something that this industry really hasn't had. They've done very specialized testing. So we're working with the operators in a project called OPNFV to make sure that the operators have 
a uniform way and it's a synthetic benchmark, but they at least understand this synthetic benchmark has this kind of performance. And so they start really being able to translate and have the vendors do comparisons on paper and they can actually do better comparisons without having to do six months of testing. So that's a really big deal. Um, the other thing that uh, I do want to also say about 5G is we're in a pre-standards world right now. ITU and 3GTP will have standards drops in 2018 and 2020 is when it will be final. But every time that you're looking at a new wireless standard, there's a lot of pre-trials that are happening. And that's because you want to test before you state everything has to work a specific way. So there was a trial was announced in December with Ericsson AT&T in Austin, Texas, in the Intel offices. And so if you happen to be in that office, you're starting to be able to experiment with what you could possibly get out of 5G. You'll see more of that with the Olympics in 2018 and 2020, where you've got Japan and Korea have said, we're going to have 5G at those Olympics. So I've got to ask you some questions, because we're going to have some guests on here on the Cube in, in the Palo Alto coverage around NFE network function virtualization, you know, plays right into the software-defined networking, you know, virtualization world. So why is NFV and SDN so vital to the network transformation? Uh, why now, and what's happening in those two areas? Uh, and what's, what's the enabler? The enabler really started about 10 years ago, the real inspiration for it, when we were all in a world of packet processing engines and network processors. And we had some people in our research labs that realized that a lot of the efficiency in doing packet processing quickly came from parallelism. And we knew there were about two or three years to wait, but that was when multi-core came out. And so this thing called Data Plane Development Kit was born. We refer to it as DPDK. It's now an industry organization, not an Intel invention anymore. The industry is starting to foster it. And that was really when the operators realized, I can run a network on a general purpose processor. <laughs> Excuse me. So they can use cores for running operating systems and applications. Of course, they always do that for, for compute cores. But they can also use the compute cores for passing packets back and forth. And the line rates that we're getting are astonishing, you know, 160 gigabits per second, which at the time we were getting like 6 million packets per second, very unimpressive 10 years ago. But now for many of those applications, we're at line rates. So that allows you to then separate the hardware and the software, which is where virtualization comes in. And when you do that, you aren't actually embedding software and hardware together and creating an appliance that if you needed to do a software update, you, don't, you might as well update the hardware too, because there's absolutely no new software loads that can happen unless you're in an environment like for virtualization or something like containers. So that's why NFV, network function virtualization, is important. It gives the operators the ability to use general purpose processors for more than one thing and have the ability to have future proofing of workloads where a new application or a, a new use becomes really popular, they don't have to issue new hardware, they just need to spin up a new virtual machine and be able to put the function in it. So now, I got, at the I end, got... if you went back and we were talking about 5G and all of this new way of managing the network, yeah, management and orchestration is really important, but SDN is also really critical both for cloud and for com because it gives you one map of the connections on the network. So you know what is connected where, and it gives you the ability to remotely change how the servers or how the hardware is connected together. If you were going to ask a CIO, what's your biggest problem today? And they would tell you that it's almost impossible for them to be able to spin up a fully functional new application that meets all the security protocols because they don't have a network map of everything that's connected to everything. They don't really have an easy way to be able to issue a command and then have all of the reconfigurations happen. A lot of the information is embedded in router tables. Yeah. So it makes it very, very hard to take advantage of a really complicated network connection map and be agile. So that's where SDN comes in. It's just kind yeah. of like a command control center 
where then a fee gives them the ability to have agility and spin up new functions very quickly. Yeah. And certainly that's where the secure, good security part, part of the action is. Lynn, I want to get your final thoughts on the final question is, this Mobile World Congress, it really encapsulates you know, years and years in the industry of kind of a tipping point, and I and and this is kind of my my uh, observation, and I want to get your thoughts on this and reaction to it. Is the telcos and the service providers are finally at a moment where there's been so much pressure on the business model. Um, we've heard this even going back many many years ago. Oh, over the top, and you're starting to see more and more pressure. This seems to be the year that people have a focus on seeing a straight and narrow set of solutions, building blocks and an ecosystem that's poised to go to the next level where there can be a business model that actually can scale, whether it's scaling the edge or having the core of the network work well uh, and, and up and down the stack. Can you talk about um, the key challenges that these service providers have to do to address that key profitability equation, that being a sustainable entity rather than being the pipes? Well, it comes down to being able to respond to the needs of the user. I'll re refer to a couple demos that we have in the data center section of our booth. And one of them is so impressive. It's China Telecom that have put together on complete commercial off-the-shelf hardware that a cloud vendor might use um, a demo that shows 4K video running from a virtualized fixed wireline connection. So one of one of the cable kind of uses. Now, 4K video goes over a virtualized environment from a cable-like environment to what we call virtual IMS, and, and that's the way that you get different messages passed between different kinds of, of systems. So IMS is wireless. So they've got 4K video from cable out to a wireless capability running in a virtualized environment at performance um, in hardware it could be used in the cloud, it could be used in communication service providers because it's general purpose. That kind of capability gives a company like China Telecom the flexibility they need. So when 5G, if the usage model for 5G that's most important turns out to be fixed wireless because it's so expensive for them to deploy new yeah. fiber, well, they have the ability to do it and they can spin it up maybe not real time, but certainly it's not going to take a three month rollout. Yes. So and hopefully that gives you one example. Well, that's great enablement. It gives them a lot of ability, uh, execution. Well, I thought it gave me one more idea for a question. So since I have my final, final question for you is, what are you most excited about? Because you sounded super excited about that demo. What are the exciting things are happening uh, in the Intel demo area from Intel that's exciting for you that you could share with the folks uh, listening and watching? So I used to never be a believer in augmented reality. <laughs> I thought, who's going to walk around with goggles? It's just silly, you know, it, it seemed to me like a toy, and, and maybe I shouldn't admit that on a radio show, but I became a believer, and I started to really understand how powerful it could be when Pokemon Go took over all the world in, over the summer, because it's an immersive experience, and it's sort of reality, but you're interacting with a brand. Well, in the booth, we have a really cool virtual reality demo, and it's with uh, Nokia and Ericsson, and it's showing 5G network transformation. The thing about virtual reality, you have to really have low latency for it to feel real, yeah. quote unquote. And so it, really, it harnesses the power that you can see just emerging with 5G, and then you get this really great immersive experience. So yeah. that I think is one that, um, you look at how popular brands like Disney are, or Disney World, yeah. or Disneyland, it's that immersive experience. So I think we're just starting to scratch the surface on the opportunities there. Lynn, thanks so much for spending the time. I know you got to go and run. Thanks so much for the commentary. We are low latency here inside the queue, bringing you all the action. It's a good title for a show, low latency, really fast, bringing all the action. Lynn, thanks so much for sharing the color and, and, and congratulations on your, uh, on, your, on your success at Mobile World Congress. And look, looking forward to getting more post-show, uh, post-mortem uh, after the event's over. Thanks for the, taking the time. We'll be back with more coverage of Mobile World Congress for special CUBE live in studio in Palo Alto covering all the action in Barcelona on Monday and Tuesday, 27th, 28th. I'm John Furrier. We'll be right back with more after this short break. Thanks for watching.